Hello, thank you very much, Rebecca. Um, and uh, it's such a pleasure to be here with you. So thanks so much indeed for joining um, joining us. So I'm going to be talking today, this evening, about uh, the wound stimulation effects of larval secretions. So this is the last um, in the series of the, the three seminars that we were exploring the science and the evidence behind what larval therapy is all about and what it does, um, particularly scientifically, in, in a wound. So what do, have we discovered when we studied the effects of larvae in wounds? Well, the first seminar looked at evidence of wound debridement, and we found that there was a, an abundance of evidence that suggests that larvae are excellent wound debriders. And then we explored as to why. Why would larvae want to debride wounds? And we discovered that it was because if for them, if they see an infected chronic wound like this, what they actually see, remember, is, is their, their meal, delicious food. So that's why they um, go ahead and eat and debride um, away the dead tissue really, really well. What else did we look at? Well, we looked at wound disinfection in seminar two. And there we also discovered that maggots have a superb ability to kill any bacterial pathogens that they find themselves in the vicinity of with it within the wound. And we asked why would maggots want to do that? And if you look at their, their wild, uh, their surroundings in, in nature, they're often um, found in corpses where there's an abundance of bacteria and fungi. So these poor maggots themselves are being attacked by these bacteria and they continue to be attacked quite at length. So they have secreted their own antibacterial factors to protect themselves against these pathogens. And of course, if we find, um, and if, if, they, if we find that we have an infected wound and we put larvae in a, in a small ulcer like this, which is infected, those larvae will secrete um, antibacterial factors for themselves, but inadvertently our wound will benefit from them. Okay, so that's, that explains two of the features that we've talked about in this series. Today, we're going to talk about uh, the effects of larvae and larval secretions in terms of wound stimulation effects. And by that, we mean, is there any evidence at all from the literature or from our own work um, in, in Swansea University that larvae have some effect in accelerating wound healing? So, we will get to the question of why would larvae do that? What, what is, in, is it in their interest to promote healing in the wound right at the very end? But before we discuss that, I want to explain to you a little bit about and discuss with you the clinical and scientific evidence that we have for wound stimulation effects um, with larvae and larval secretions. So in order to do that, I'd like to very, very quickly look at the physiology of wound healing. How do wounds heal? And, and, and I've kept this incredibly simple and basic. We know that there are three main phases of wound healing. There's an inflammatory phase, which is the very first phase, and then a proliferative phase. And then the third and final phase is that of the maturation or remodeling of the tissue, the new tissue that's been formed, the healed tissue. So the first phase, the inflammatory phase, is by far um, the, the, the largest in the sense that it's, the wound is still very big at this stage. Um, and what happens here is that um, a process called inflammation occurs, which I think you all know about. Um, the whole idea of inflammation is to allow white blood cells, which are the leukocytes, to come into that wound, and, and mainly the phagocytes, which will destroy the, the, the non-viable tissue. And these cells are known as the neutrophils and the macrophages. Um, and they really are, are arriving at the wound site to destroy any bacteria that are there, any pathogens that are there and to clear away non-viable tissue and any wound debris that happens to be there. Following that, we get the next phase, which is the proliferative phase. Now, this phase is really, really important. What happens in the proliferative phase? Well, in this phase, really good cells called fibroblasts, which are very, very important healing cells, begin to proliferate, increase in number and migrate into the wound bed. The fibroblasts are stimulated to do this migration and proliferation by a series of chemical activators and messengers, which are released also at this time, and they are known as cytokines. And they're actually released by the cells that came into the inflammatory phase. Now, remember that 
when you see a chronic wound and it's stalled, it's not healing, it's stuck and it's stuck in the inflammatory phase. Um, and it can't progress to the proliferative phase unless the debris is gone, the non-viable tissue has been debrided and there is no infection, that's critical. Okay, so all these things are happening, but fibroblasts can only come into the wound bed once the, the, um, the pathogens and the debris has, has been cleared. Why do the fibroblasts need to migrate into the wound bed? Well, they are the things that are going to synthesize new extracellular matrix, new tissue, and that is new elastin and new collagen. And that's what you want to happen uh, if you want a wound to heal, right? So all these things have to go ahead for a wound to heal. The fibroblasts themselves secrete their own factors, their own cytokines, and some of these are known as the wound growth factors, and you must have heard of some of these things like platelet-derived growth factor and tissue growth factor. So these are really, really important molecules that need to activate the wound to heal, okay, and some of these are secreted by the fibroblasts themselves. So these cytokines that the fibroblasts secrete allow other vital cells to proliferate. And some of these include the endothelial cells, and we'll talk a bit more about these later. But these endothelial cells are going to give rise to new blood vessels. And why do we need that to happen? Well, when you've got new tissue being formed, that requires oxygen. The growth of new tissue requires oxygen. So in order for that to happen, you need the development of new blood capillaries. And that process is known as angiogenesis. That's got to happen for a wound to heal. And all that together is known as granulation tissue. And that, as you all know, is the sign that a wound is healing and you're looking for the development of healthy granulation tissue when you're looking to, to, to see whether a wound has actually begun to heal or not. Ultimately, in this phase, the wound will begin to develop new epithelium tissue. That's your epidermis on top, epidermis on top of the, the, the wound. So it's new, healthy uh, first layer of the skin. And the, the wound will also shrink in size. OK, so all this goes on in phase two the proliferative phase. And then your final phase, um, which is remodeling, is when you've got freshly healed skin, freshly healed dermis. And in, in this phase, it, you, you can, it can go on up to years because it's, it's basically where the collagen that was laid down to begin with, which was type three, is a bit weak. That needs to be remodeled and cross-linked and get stronger and stronger. And that will become your final um, stronger type collagen. And the wound might contract a bit further. And that will be your maturation phase. Okay, so that in a nutshell is wound healing, is how wounds heal. Now, the key points to take away from this, ones that I'm going to refer to in terms of the evidence that we have for the action of larval secretions are, are these. Remember, phagocytes arrive, the neutrophils and macrophages have to get there to start the process of clearing that wound bed. Secondly, we said that fibroblasts, these really good cells, need to migrate into the wound bed and they need to proliferate, they need to increase in number. Then you get the release of these growth factors and cytokines, which do many things, but they also they, they, one of the things they do is to stimulate the vital blood vessel cells, for example, to proliferate. And that is known as angiogenesis and results in the growth of new tissue. Um, so you've got, sorry, it results in the growth of new blood capillaries so you can enable the growth of new tissue. So th those are the key points to remember, and we'll come back to those in a minute. Okay, <clears throat> excuse me. So what do we know about the role of larvae in stimulating wounds, in, in accelerating or promoting the, 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 these healing effects of wounds? Well, for years, uh, there have been zillions of anecdotal reports where clinicians who have put maggots on wounds looked at the wound and, and when they removed the maggots, they thought, wow, this is amazing. This is the granulation tissue has, 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 has emerged really, really fast. And, and I'm convinced that that wound is healing faster than it would have compared to non-maggot treated wounds. And that's anecdotal. And I've heard loads of reports from nurses and clinicians and, and medics who've said, you know, I don't know what that's going on, but something really is happening. And it hasn't been until very recently that this aspect of maggot therapy, the healing aspect or the stimulation aspect has been investigated and it's been investigated clinically and scientifically. Um, of course, the, the evidence that we now have that does support maggot induced wound stimulation comes from numerous sources, the controlled trials, clinical studies, um, scientific laboratory investigations and case studies. And we're going to talk about all of those um, briefly um, uh, this evening. <clears throat> 
I'm going to begin with a clinical case. And this is the one that I showed you um, way back in, I think it was July when I did my first talk with you, when we looked at speedy debridement by maggots. And I showed you the case of some Japanese um, surgeons who um, presented a case of a 78 year old man who had critical limb ischemia. So he had nothing, no, very, very poor perfusion of the feet, very poor oxygen um, delivery to his extremities. Um, and therefore he had severe ulcers and they were and you've got exposed bone on his right foot, but you can also see his toes were all um, was, were all ulcerating as well, and he had a, an, an ulcer there too. So the Japanese surgeons did a trans um, they, they they did they took his toes off basically a trans metatarsal amputation. But then what happened was a couple of months later that. Um, amputation site dehissed, and you can see it became infected. Now, one of the surgical team um, said, why don't we try maggots? And they did, and literally they put maggots on, and within two days, you can see how clearly, how quickly they debrided that wound. But that's not the reason why I'm showing you this case study. What the surgeons had also done was they had monitored the skin perfusion, oh, sorry, two months later, the wound was absolutely fine. There was no uh, recurrence of infection, and that went on to heal. But what the surgeons had done was that they had measured the skin perfusion pressure around the amputation site. Now, in the UK, I know we don't really use skin perfusion pressure as a measurement of oxygen delivery, but they, they were looking at that. And they found that before maggot therapy, that wound was very poorly perfused, 25 um, millimeters of mercury at that point. Whereas after maggot therapy, it went up greatly to 54 um, uh, millimeters of mercury. And they did the same with the on the dorsal aspect and the plantar aspect of the foot. And they discovered that again, you'd got an increase in the perfusion, um, skin perfusion pressure after maggot therapy. So the, the, the researchers concluded that the larvae somehow have caused an increase in the perfusion pressure and therefore an increase in oxygen supply to the tissue. But they could not explain that. They had no idea as to why that was happening. Okay, so how do we, uh, how, what's the evidence showing us about how larvae do stimulate wounds? Right, remember, let's go back to our proliferative phase. You've got to, when you've got a wound that's healing, like, like this, this hand wound is healing really nicely here, you know that once the necrotic and infected tissue has gone, that wound can now progress to phase two, to its proliferative phase. And here we know that granulation occurs. Look at this lovely granulation tissue that's occurring here. You can also see the really nice pink um, epithelial tissue, the new epidermis. Um, the, the new epiderm is forming and that's going to migrate in as well. So this is going on. This is new tissue being laid down. And for that to happen, we said that fibroblasts need to migrate inwards and they generate and they assemble the collagen and the elastin. That's what these cells look like. This is one fibroblast cell here. OK, so they're really long, stretchy, quite cute looking cells. They're the cells that have got to migrate into the wound bed. What do we know about maggots and maggot secretions? Do they have any effect on fibroblasts and therefore wound stimulation? Well, yes. So researchers have shown in 2015, researchers showed that if you added the salivary gland extract of maggots uh, onto fibroblasts, they massively increased the number. So you've got this brilliant fibroblast proliferation going on. And then, excuse me, <coughs> David Pritchard from Nottingham University in 2012 actually did a superb piece of work where he showed that by adding maggot secretions to some fibroblasts, um, they migrated very quickly across the wound bed compared to fibroblasts that had had no maggot secretions added to them. And I've got a video that his, his video to show you, um, if I can quickly show you the difference, you could see the cells traveling across the wound bed. The first um, video is with no maggot secretion, and the second is when he added 0.1 micrograms of, uh, of maggot secretion, and a tiny amount. But you can see how well the fibroblasts with the maggot secretion migrate fast across the wound bed, but also they are lined up. There's just more organization to the fibroblasts compared to this lovely haphazard way that these poor um, fibroblasts are exhibiting there. So he showed that the, the mig migration of fibroblasts was greatly influenced in the presence of maggot secretions. Again, that's what you want to happen uh, if you want wounds to heal. So we can see here this brilliant image of fibroblasts actually secreting their elastin and collagen. And as this is a UV image, and as they secrete it, the, the, the turquoisey blue uh, um, 
uh, color that you see is because they are growth factors being secreted alongside the elastin and collagen. So the fibroblasts are arriving at the wound bed, they're secreting these really brilliant growth factors which are necessary to help the wound to heal. And remember, some of those growth factors allow endothelial cells to proliferate and that process we discussed was called angiogenesis. What is angiogenesis? And let's look at it. These are tiny little capillary buds that are growing from the wound, okay, and they're growing up and they'll loop over. And that's why when you look at granulation tissue, you see these little loops of blood capillaries. That's the formation of your new capillaries. And remember, they're really important to provide oxygen for the growth of new tissues. So angiogenesis begins, and these capillary tubes form, but they, it begins with the proliferation of endothelial cells. Well, what are endothelial cells? These are endothelial cells. They're the cells that line the capillaries, of, of the blood capillaries. So they're going to give rise to the blood capillaries. And when a wound is healing, it must have these new blood uh, vessels so that oxygen can be given to the, the growing wound. So in, so at Swansea, my team decided to investigate whether maggot secretions had any effect at all on anything to do with angiogenesis of, of, wound, of a wound when it heals. And what we'd done, we'd detected in maggot secretions, we'd run the whole maggot secretions across uh, with, the, with the help of my biochemistry friends, and we'd detected the presence of three particular amino acids. And the reason why we got excited about these three amino acids, histidine, valinol, and 3GPA, we were excited about these because these are known to be really important amino acids in wounds and in, in wound healing. So we thought, right, let's investigate to see whether any of these amino acids have any effect on endothelial cells. So we looked at the three amino acids and their ability to increase the proliferation of um, blood capillary cells. We used human endothelial cells, and these are called HUVEX. They're isolated from um, umbilical vein um, cells. So these are the cells that we used in our test. And we discovered that all three of these amino acids stimulated the, the HUVEC cells, these blood endothelial cells, to proliferate. So they started like that and they massively increased in number. And then we showed further that when you had um, just looked at valinol, which is one of these, which was the best amino acid in terms of proliferation, we found that in just 48 hours, in two days, valinol had actually um, caused a 25% increase in these HUVEC cells. And then the other two amino acids did the same thing, but in three days. And the reason why we looked at this time period was related to the amount of time that maggots are put on a wound. So we, we related it to the, the, the amount of time the secretions might be in contact with the wound bed, and therefore these amino acids might have a chance to act. So we actually, oops, sorry, and that work we published um, in 2010. So those results suggested that amino acids that we identified in, in um, maggot secretions did or could exert a pro-angiogenic effect. And obviously, if that's happening, that might contribute to wound stimulation. Let's continue focusing a little bit on endothelial cells and angiogenesis, because it's such an important part of wound healing. So when endothelial cells are ready to create new blood vessels so that the tissue can grow, they begin to sprout. They begin to form these tiny little tubes, which are going to become the new blood vessels that we need to see in the wound. So some Chinese researchers in 2016 did some fantastic wound healing research using maggot secretions. What they did was they incubated endothelial cells, these tiny little um, blood vessel cells with maggot secretions. And they showed a significantly higher proliferation of the endothelial cells and indeed the formation of these capillary tubes that I've just shown you. But what these researchers also did was they monitored the level of two glycoproteins. Okay, now these glycoproteins, doesn't matter what they're called, CD34 and CD68, they are really important in the wound because they upregulate endothelial cell activity. That means that they allow or they promote endothelial cells to divide and to form these tubes. And therefore, they're considered really important markers of angiogenesis. OK, so monitoring these two levels of glycoprotein, they found that patients who had had maggot therapy in their tissue, which they looked at histologically, they, they found increased levels of these glycoproteins compared to before maggot therapy. And they just they, they, they concluded that these raised levels enabled better endothelial cell activity and therefore promoted angiogenesis. OK, so 
uh, again, you must go to these papers and have a look at them if you want to further investigate how that work was done. So I'm going to carry on by talking about endothelial cell activity by looking at something called microRNAs. Now, please don't get too confused and bogged down by it. I'm going to try and explain it really simply. So what are microRNAs and what is their role in wound healing? And then how, how do maggots influence that? Well, a microRNA is a tiny little molecule, very small. Don't worry about the fact that it's a non-coding RNA molecule. Basically, it functions in the regulation of gene expression in, in, wound, in many, many aspects of wound repair. This is what it looks like. All right. Doesn't really matter what it looks like. So basically, what I'm saying is a microRNAs circulate in the blood. And we now know they've emerged as very important regulators in many physiological processes, including wound healing. Normally, if you've got a diabetic foot ulcer and you've got this chronic ulcer, chronic wound, you have impaired angiogenesis. It's one of the main features and the main factors that affects your healing of that wound. OK, so some a, a, a group in 2017 decided to look at microRNA molecule, a particular one called MIR126, which th they knew and we know is expressed by endothelial cells, which are is responsible for angiogenesis. So responsible for many, many functions. So this little molecule was what they decided to look at. All right. Now, we know, remember, that low levels of this molecule are associated with poor angiogenesis and, and vascular disease as a result of poor angiogenesis. Genesis. So in vitro, what these guys did was they monitored the, um, th they looked at cultured endothelial cells in the presence of larval secretions and monitored the amount of MIR126, the amount of this RNA. They looked at different concentrations of larval secretions and they found a significant rise in the expression of this um, tiny little microRNA when you had larval secretions present in, the, in um, the presence of endothelial cells. Okay, that was their laboratory work. Then they looked at patients in vivo, all right? And they looked at the levels of this, this tiny little molecule in the peripheral blood of patients. They actually had loads of patients. They had 79 patients who had normal blood glucose, nothing, you know, nothing wrong with them at all. They were absolutely fine. Then they had 93 patients who had been diagnosed with type 2 diabetes, but did not have any diabetic foot alteration at this point. And they also had a cohort of patients, 90 patients, who had type 2 diabetes, but also had the presence of diabetic foot ulcers, all right? So they're looking at the levels of this, this tiny little molecule in the peripheral blood of these patients. Remember, this tiny little molecule is important in promoting angiogenesis and low levels of it were associated with poor healing and, vascular, and, and low vascular integrity. So what they discovered um, when they looked at just the normal patients, normal blood glucose patients, the, the levels were normal. They're what you expected. OK, when they looked at the patients who had diabetes, but no ulcers, they had lower levels, much lower levels of this MIR126. And when they looked at patients with diabetes and ulcers, they had exceedingly low levels of this, this molecule. That, that would explain why these, these patients had very poor healing. Then what, what these researchers did was they took the 90 patients who had foot diabetes and foot ulcers, and they split them so that 57 of them were treated with maggot therapy and the rest were not. They were uh, treated with a control. And they found that after maggot therapy, the levels in all the 57 patients, the levels of this tiny little molecule increased and significantly higher than, than the, the, the levels were significantly higher following treatment with maggots than before treatment. So that's a really interesting finding. For some reason, the application of maggot therapy promoted the production of this MIR126, which is what you want because you want to associate it with um, better angiogenesis and therefore better wound stimulation um, and wound healing. Now, angiogenesis is quite complicated. We know that it begins and then it flourishes and you get more and more capillaries um, being formed as a result of the initiation of angiogenesis. And, and these new blood, uh, blood capillaries are laid down so that the new tissue, new cells can be fed the oxygen that they need. Very recent research by another Chinese group investigated the role of microRNAs, further role of microRNAs, different ones in regulating wound repair. 
And they looked at a particular cluster. So they didn't just look at one, they looked at loads of microRNAs in patients before and after treatment with maggots. And they found that they got a massive upregulation of patients' wound tissue with a particular MR, uh, microRNA after treatment with maggot therapy. So that's just more evidence that um, these little molecules that are important in wound healing are upregulated following maggot therapy. But angiogenesis has both, um, angiogenesis occurs due to pro-angiogenic factors. But in our bodies, in our wounds, we also have anti-angiogenic factors, and they exist to sort of make a control mechanism. You don't want angiogenesis to go bonkers and start producing blood vessels willy-nilly. So you do have a, a balancing anti-angiogenic anti factors. And these researchers in 2020 looked at one of these anti-angiogenic factors. They looked at thrombospondin, the expression of this particular protein. This protein is a negative regulator of angiogenesis. So if you've got this protein, protein, um, this is going to bring angiogenesis down, all right? So it's not brilliant for wound healing because it'll stop wound healing. And they discovered that in, um, in, in patients who'd had maggot therapy, this was brought down, which was great. This thrombospondin was stopped from working and therefore angiogenesis could happen and therefore wounds could heal, okay? And that, to these researchers, they concluded that that suggested that maggot secretions have, they, they inhibit this anti-angiogenic antigenic agent, uh, thrombospondin, and therefore they play a better role in assisting tissue repair and, and wound healing. So in terms of angiogenesis, maggot therapy does increase the expression of key molecules and it down-regulates anti-angiogenic molecules that are involved in capillary formation and wound healing. So we have more and more evidence to show that maggots actually do stimulate blood capillary formation and therefore provide more oxygen to a wound that is trying to heal. And that these, these scientific studies may explain the findings of the Japanese group when they looked at that patient with their skin perfusion pressure in the 2014 study. We've got other evidence, not just on angiogenesis. We have evidence that maggots can inhibit ongoing inflammation. Now, remember, you don't want inflammation to keep going on. You want infl the inflammatory phase to stop and you want your wound to go into prolif the, the proliferative phase. Um, and, we've and, and we've got some researchers, Kazander et al. showed very clearly that the inflammation is actually inhibited by the maggots at, at some point on their, on their, when they're on the wound. There's also been some really interesting research to show that there's a, an increased migration of human uh, epidermal cells um, in the presence of a particular signaling protein. Um, and remember, we talked about the fact that epithelial cells need to come in, they need to migrate in to form the new epidermis, you know, when you've got, um, uh, when the wound is beginning to heal. So that's also been shown. And I'm going to really finish off by talking about a couple of clinical things. There was a, a clinical case study, well, not, sorry, a clinical study, a wound healing study on 39 patients with critical limb ischemia who had already undergone um, midfoot amputation, but their wounds were not healing. So they split these patients up into a, a maggot debridement therapy group and a control group, and they just showed that with maggots, you had an 86% of wound heal uh, wounds were healing compared to 38% in the control group. Um, and, and another um, systematic review very recently has shown that maggot therapy facilitates faster and more effective debridement, which we already know, but it also enables faster development of granulation tissue and increased reduction in wound surface area compared to hydrogel dressings. And, and even though this, this review, or the literature they examined, they did not show any effect on disinfection or complete healing rate of the wound, the authors have still concluded that maggot therapy should be considered because the granulation tissue development and the wound surface area reduction is better using maggots. This is really recent research um, in, in 2021, which has examined wound healing rates following application of Lucilia sericata, for, uh, following application of larvae. And they have shown that the density of maggots accelerates the rate of ulcer healing, i.e. if you increase the maggot density, you get better healing. And what they did, they've shown that by doubling their application from five to 10 centimeters squared, uh, maggots to center per centimeter squared, you increase the healing rate by over 20%. 
Okay, um, and I'm going to conclude with limb salvage, which is really quite important. Um, and, and I know that, you know, a lot of you know about this. This is there's increasing published evidence suggesting that maggots can actually prevent amputation. Well, what evidence do we have? A 2017 study looked at 28 patients um, and uh, between uh, according to the study, there were 29 wounds, some diabetic foot ulcers and also some pressure ulcers present in these 28 patients, of which 13 were scheduled for amputation. They've put maggot therapy on all of these wounds and all the wounds with maggot therapy were completely debrided, some with just one or two cycles of maggot therapy. In some cases, osteomyelitis were present. Um, well, in fact, in all cases, they, they said, if you look at this paper, you'll see what, what they stated about osteomyelitis, but that was eradicated and that didn't reoccur three years post follow-up. And more importantly, all those limbs that were scheduled for amputation were saved, okay? Um, I'm going to talk to you about two case studies now, which reflect this really nicely. This is a case of an elderly, uh, well, police officer actually, he wasn't quite elderly. He was he was doing um, um, a shift in Bridge End and he was attacked by a group of youths and he was kicked repeatedly in the knees um, with the, to, in the result that both his knees were shattered and needed replacing. Well, they replaced the first knee and they discovered that it became infected and they couldn't get rid of the infection, so they amputated above the knee. This was his second knee replacement surgery. And you can see again that the wound was infected and that again was scheduled for an above knee amputation. Someone in the team suggested trying maggots and the, the, the police officer agreed and they put larvae on, they put them on free range. You can see them there on the wound, um, on the on the, the cap, the necrotic cap of the wound. And here's the prosthesis. You can see the larvae working their way on that infected wound and they cleared it. And they cleared it completely to the point where that leg was um, saved, that leg went on to heal and that knee was, was completely saved from amputation. Then we have a case history of another um, fellow. Um, this was uh, a case history presented by some Dutch surgeons. They talked about the case of a 16 year old male patient who was admitted to intensive care. He had meningitis, he developed meningococcal sepsis. He survived the acute episode of sepsis, but he developed infectious necrosis of the extremities of his hands and feet. And we're just going to look at one of his hands. And there you can see the necrotic um, the, uh, infection that's, that's set into his, his hand following meningitis. They, the, the surgeons did a partial amputation of some of his fingers and, and his thumb, and um, they found at that point when they swabbed there was staph aureus, there was great infection going on, they started massive treatment with uh, anti intravenous antibiotics, but you still had a, a, um, a, an infection in that patient. So at that point they put sterile maggots on, biobags, onto the wounds, and you can see the biobags here onto the, 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 the hand. Within three days, the patient's clinical situation had improved substantially and the fever subsided. They repeated maggot therapy, the wounds showed significant improvement, granulating tissue had begun to grow and there was no further need for surgical debridement. After two months, the patient was discharged and five month follow up, this is the situation. He could use both his hands very well and he saved his fingers. And the, the surgeons themselves concluded that um, they would have probably done an open amputation of both extremities. They were very scared about the infection about the progression of this this uh, infection and they would have um, amputated below the elbow joint however because they treated it with maggots they they dis they they prevented the need for this disabling amputation okay and that was done in 2002. The most recent report that I can find is 2021, January 2021, a Nigerian hospital um, in the federal state of Kano has reported that they started using maggots to help treat patients with diabetic, with, with diabetes, um, uh, with chronic wounds. And in June 2020, they started it. And in six months, they've saved 30 limbs from being amputated. So, you know, the evidence is mounting about how brilliant these creatures are. And there, there's a link there to, um, 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 to that paper. So my final point is, we know we have evidence about the fact that larvae are stimulating wounds, they can stimulate wounds to, to progress to heal. Why? Why would maggots want to do that? There's nothing in their life cycle that would suggest the need to do that. And my answer to you is, well, we're still exploring why. But 
I believe, and a lot of colleagues believe, that it's not a planned thing. It's an inadvertent effect. So when you put maggots in a wound, there is wound stimulation, but that's nothing to do with what the maggots have planned, okay? It's all inadvertent. And I can show you my last bit of research, which is on larval growth factors. We know that wound healing, I've already explained to you, is regulated by human growth factors, such as platelet-derived growth factor and vascular endothelial growth factor. That They're really important factors in a wound to help a wound to heal. We know that, okay? But look, what we also know, oh, I'm just showing you how these, these factors, um, teach transforming growth factor and so on and so on are really important for enhanced wound healing. But we also know that on a wound, larvae are growing. You put your larvae on as L1, L2, they're tiny little things, they've got to grow, okay? And they grow from L1s to L3s when you take them off three days later they grow by producing their own growth factors, okay? They produce their own hormones. That enables them to grow from L1 to L3. Like this, L1, tiny L1s, they grow to L3 by producing their own growth factors. So my group wanted to see what I wanted to see, and I asked my group to have a look at whether the growth factors that the, maggot produ that the maggots produce have any similarity to some of our known human growth factors, which are going to help a wound to heal. And we wanted to see whether there's any homology between these two different, different factors. And the way you do that is you run gels. You've got your maggot secretions, you've got your human growth factors, you put them together and you see, do any match up? Is there any homology? And actually, we found that, yes, there is. The best homology we found was to transforming growth factor, where the maggot level of transforming growth factor met absolutely 100% with the human growth factor. So it's almost like the maggot growth factor mimics the human growth factor. And we found that to be the case for many other different growth factors that we looked at with maggot secretions. There's only one hep hepatocyte growth factor that we couldn't find homology to, but the others, that it was there, okay? We published this work in 2019. It's early research. We have shown that insect growth factors mimic or have homology to human growth factors. And it could be that the wound is stimulated uh, and, and accelerated to, to heal because of these mimicky wound um, growth factors. Of course, we need to fur further undertake research to check that this actually is happening by looking at wound assays and cell migration and so on. So in summary, and I'm sorry, I've taken a little bit longer. Um, what is the role of larvae in wound stimulation and healing? We know we have specific factors in larval secretions that promote fibroblasts, these good cells, to proliferate and to migrate into the wound bed. We can see that larvae can help to promote angiogenesis. We see that larvae can play a role in limb salvage. And we know now that growth factors are present in larval secretions, which show homology to human growth factors. I've got to thank my lab scientists in Swansea University, my maggot team. Loads of us have worked throughout the years since 2001 on these projects, um, beginning with Dr. Alison Bexfield, who was my first PhD student, who started all of this off for us. Um, and I've got to say I've been funded by Action Medical Research, by the European Union, by the Welsh Government, by many, many different people. Thanks indeed to Biamon for inviting me to speak at these seminars. And I just remains for me to moon you all and thank you for attending and listening to my seminars. Thank you very much.